thank you so much for coming. I am really excited about this evening. I am. Um, I can't tell you how much. Um, it's important to me that all of you have the chance to hear from this extraordinary guest of ours, Mark Dimunation, who is the chief of rare books and special collections at the Library of Congress. One of the, 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 the areas in which um, Mark specializes is, um, or are, um, antiquarian books, rare books, and fine binding, or sorry, fine print, and of course our favorite here at the museum, um, <laughs> artist books. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. And in the interest of full disclosure, I have to admit that Mark is the only man who has ever um, caused me to be um, totally book drunk. <laughs> <laughs> There's one thing that I, that I didn't realize when um, I was thinking about having Mark come, and um, I understood it when I was visiting at the Library of Congress, and we were in maybe our third or fourth hour of looking at extraordinary artist books, and I said, Mark, I'm so jealous. And he said, why? All of these books belong to you. <laughs> and that is true. All of the books that he has been collecting have been collected on our behalf. And so tonight we have a chance to see has he been doing a good job? <laughs> it's my pleasure to introduce Mark Dimulation. Uh, thank you. Thank you. You know, I've been tricked again. I didn't realize I was coming for my job, uh, in a, my job uh, analysis for the year. Um, so, am I doing a good job? I guess is the question. Hi, everybody. Um, I, I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here. I, I challenge anybody in this audience, first of all, to say no to Cynthia. <laughs> just, just try it. It's really very hard. But um, it, wasn't really, it wasn't really an issue for me, um, in part because we just had one of those uh, fantastic moments. I know there are book artists in the audience, and I know there are librarians in the audience, and I know there are many fans of uh, Cynthia's collection, rightly so, and others. And you, you know that moment. It's when you're talking with somebody about an artist book and either you know it and you, and you end up having one of those conversations where you never land on a proper noun. It's just, <laughs> it's just do you, did you, have you seen yes? And what about, oh yeah, I know. And you, what you, yes. And, and this was going on book after book. So the challenge ultimately became, I have to show her something she doesn't know so we can have that moment of silence so I can then point out to her, by the way, this is mine. <laughs> uh, but then she turned around and went home and bought them anyway. So, so they're now all of ours. So I, I want to thank Cynthia, Cynthia uh, Sears um, and Frank Buxton also for their graciousness, but Cynthia for the invitation. Um, Greg Robinson and, and, and Peter, Rafa have been um, interacting with me. There are many other museum people that I met today. This is a lovely, lovely place. And it's a great museum. It's very comfortable. Um, it's about giving you the experience to, the opportunity to experience the art in, in a um, casual, unpretentious, real way. And um, I had the opportunity today uh, to do with Cynthia what she did when she was visiting me at the Library of Congress, which is I got to step into her sandbox and, <laughs> and play with her books. Um, and, for, and we had a, a grand time dropping uh, proper nouns once again. <laughs> so um, I was, um, a couple of my friends from way back, book artists, uh, walked in. I was very pleased to see them. And I said, you know, I don't know what I was thinking when I came up with this idea. This is, um, I'm going to choose 13 living artists, basically, and make their books really important. And hi, glad to see you. You're not one of the 13. <laughs> so um, 
uh, this slide is wrong. <laughs> we're going to we're going to do my friends and their books. No. Um, so what I, I this came from a notion of a conversation. It grew out of a notion of a conversation that I was having with Cynthia while we were looking at books, because although we are playing in the same area of material, we're coming from very different impulses, and we have very different set of instructions, so to speak, as to uh, how we go after material, what we're going after, who we're buying it for, whose money we're spending, all of those things. And it does create different collections. I'm sorry my colleague uh, Sandra Krippa isn't here today because she does a lovely job in Washington and, and has a great skill at getting books in a way that none of the rest of us can get and does it with an eye towards the spectacular and, uh, and the modest and the humble and the strong. And she and I have been colleagues for many, many decades. I adore her and her work is really good. And we build completely different collections. So this is an area in which we're open to a lot of freedom and expression. Uh, what I'm going to be doing is talking about 13 books which signal, in some ways, um, an aspect of my collection. So all of these people, although I'm listing them individually, are really placeholders for a larger number of books that do this kind of thing. Um, I have a few favorites in here, but many of them represent the nature of my collecting. Uh, and then um, I'll be going quickly through slides because there was a lot I wanted you to see. And I wanted to make sure I had the opportunity to at least um, have you experience some of that. Good. So, are we ready? Yes. Do we have the signs in the back? Yes. We're ready? What did we promise? The opening line was, Solly and Green is people, right? <laughs> okay. We were organizing a little counter-protest against me in case, it, in case it got long. I was giving him signs to read. So let's get started. We're looking at Kevin Osborne's Vector Rev. Um, as I was mentioning, the contemporary artist book has prompted both a spirit of community, but also has prompted a real dilemma for many of us in the field. Um, as it propels further and further away from very traditional roots, that is from codex or, or the book form, letterpress, craft, text, the more closely it aligns itself with its own vision and its own voice, and the more it relies upon its own devices to make its meaning transparent. As the modern book artist springs into its own form, uh, with its own aesthetic and language and sometimes its own shape and function, the more we're called upon as readers and curators to bridge the distance between the artist's intention and the actual re meaning that's received. So when artist books arrived on the scene, I was just coming into librarianship actually at the time, they broke all boundaries of format and content and production. They were completely um, um, quizzical for many of us. They issued the challenge of demanding that they be placed in direct juxtaposition to much more traditional book art. And they wanted us to redefine the notion of the book as an object. It was inevitable then that questions, thank God we're done with these questions, uh, questions regarding the book began to emerge. What defines an object as a book? When, do, uh, when does a book have content? When is it art? Well, things are beginning to change. I've noticed over the past few years that such distinctions really carry a little weight, uh, especially with the artists themselves. And, uh, and their work begins to express that in a certain way. We're beginning to move beyond categories that were once useful in identifying what we do and um, giving us a freer sense of the book arts and beginning to talk about uh, the good thing, which is the actual art itself, as opposed to some sort of category that it falls into. So with more than 50 years of this phenomenon behind us, I started as a mere child, um, <laughs> we're at a point, I believe, in which we need to take stock of our collections and to assess our efforts at documenting this very important innovation in the history of the book. Are we collecting artist books appropriately? This is one of my favorite books, Challenging for Many, Keith Smith's book number 91. Um, I can tell you what the other 90 are, but at the moment, this is book number 91. So how do we really begin to talk about this? Well, the field really lacks sort of the useful boundaries that could contain this discussion. If you look at art on the wall, if you look at sculpture, there's a very formal language that surrounds it. We don't really have that here. Um, and in fact, of late, it's evident that the term artist book 
is now used frequently for everything from the old Parisian livre d'artiste to fine press printing to the contemporary book as object. So we're really dealing with a very large cache of material. If we're called upon to set parameters for our collections, outlines, guidance, to define the boundaries, can we, could we, should we? Private collectors, one of them is here, uh, of artist books are liberated um, from this concern to some degree. Um, Duke Collier, who's a famous uh, collector on the East Coast, uh, pointed out at a recent Center for the Book Arts Anniversary Symposium, if you know Duke Collier, you'll really know the tone of voice this comes out in. I know what I like and I buy it. Anything more complicated than that is a mere nuisance. <laughs> I immediately went home and tried that with my boss. It really didn't work very well. <laughs> um, most institutional collections, of course, don't really have this luxury. Uh, all of us are working under some set of assumptions, although there is as many approaches as there are collections out there. Smaller collections can successfully limit their collecting by geography or by format or by genre. Um, they can take on a strong curatorial tie if somebody's been around for a long time. I suppose that's beginning to happen a little bit at LC. Um, or tie in with other subject uh, strengths throughout the collections where they buy only books relating to Civil War subjects because of their Civil War strengths. Uh, but at the Library of Congress, we are a national collection, and I have to collect nationally. So setting aside for a moment the question of the boundaries of one's collecting, there are criteria for evaluating individual selections that evolved over time in my own practice, um, and partly as a response to the constantly shifting nature of book arts themselves. To clarify this point, um, we're going to view a number of, of artists tonight that I believe do, their books do stand on their own. For me, they meet the criteria that I apply to all book arts material when I'm considering them as a reader and more importantly as a curator. I look for transparency, quality, and integrity. Simply put, is the artist's intention clearly received? Do I understand what they're saying? Is the project made with a high attention to craft? Or if it's purposely avoiding craft, is that obvious? And finally, does the book have resonance? Is it true to its intention? Is it genuine? These are works that rest at one end of the spectrum of comprehension, where the artist's vision is transmitted clearly, and the artistic intention and the choices have resonance and in part meaning. So, a baker's dozen. I've been told that in some cases it's 11, but we're going with 13 tonight. <laughs> a baker's dozen, a highly selective batch of books that have helped me shape the nation's collection and have given meaning and direction to the discussion of the artist's book at a national level. The examples that follow cover the distance from fine press projects to graffiti. We will see everything from traditional texts on, uh, to a play on words to a random selection to phrases, of phrases, and in one case, I believe, no words whatsoever. We will look at highly visual books, and we will visit books that communicate only through a tactile experience. We will be um, offered the private revelation of an individual's inner thoughts. We will be challenged by the political agenda of a cooperative group of anonymous authors. Some are straightforward. Some require very careful deliberation. They all speak for themselves. With over 100 books in more than 60 years, the Gehenna Press is certainly one of the most successful private presses of this or any generation. The Library of Congress holds a comprehensive set of Gehenna, and because of our long association with Leonard Baskin, the library has numerous deluxe and special editions that include original manuscripts, wood blocks, sketches, proof poles, um, deluxe and variant copies. What they bring to this discussion is the revelation that for Leonard Baskin, the letterpress book created an avenue for depiction, for shape, for image, and for context. Even in the midst of a highly traditional craft, Leonard Baskin pushed the boundaries. With 20 poems and 25 engravings, Capriccio, which was published in 1990, is a difficult work on many levels and is, I think, one of the most important pieces that has come out of the grand Gehenna Press tradition. Uh, it's one of several projects that Baskin carried out with the English poet laureate Ted Hughes. It's somewhat ambiguous, implying at first a rather joyful piece 
but as the sequence plays out, it unravels into something much deeper and darker. It's about unmotivated acts. The topic is a difficult one for Hughes, who's full of tragedy and loss, defensiveness and remorse, and indeed equally so for the reader, because it is a response to the suicides of Sylvia Plath and Asa um, Webel. Capriccio is profusely illustrated with woodcuts and etchings of various sizes and printed in an enormous format. And Leonard Baskin is the first of the book artists that will turn, well, he's no longer with us, but will turn to an audience and say, I'm not a printer, I'm a printmaker. And this is, although he produces the, one of the most beautifully executed fine press operations of the 20th century, this is really about Leonard Baskin as an interpreter of text through illustration. Uh, but the book itself is a combination of typography and image. Both of them are masterful hallmarks on Leonard Baskin's works. It's rarely found to this extent in his other Gehenna Press publications. Here's an image from Capitrio. You know, these are full page, that's a full page image. Now, many years later, uh, in 2001, uh, Baskin reunited with Ted Hughes and uh, produced or Asaya with Hughes's new translation. Baskin died in the preparation and printing of this piece. Uh, but it was the piece that he felt one of his finest in terms of Gehenna Press publications and one that for him really sealed the relationship that he had with Ted Hughes. A difficult one that he has to defend because Ted Hughes is often under attack by modern, a modern, more modern social view of literature and the, the Sylvia Plath school and the Ted Hughes school often don't see eye to eye. Um, but Bassett nonetheless had a, an ability to work with Hughes as a poet and create a work that only is possible because Leonard Baskin and Ted Hughes sat in a room together. Uh, and for that reason, this becomes, um, Ted uh, Gahanna becomes the first of the dozen. Um, we are looking here at the title page and uh, one of the images from the Oristaya. Um, it was conceived and laid out by Baskin. It was uh, printed by uh, his printer. There are many other people oftentimes that are involved with Baskin um, publications. Arthur Larson, um, Dan Kehiler at, in Hadley, Massachusetts, did the printing. Claudia Cohen, who I believe is in this neighborhood now, uh, did the binding. The woodcuts by Baskin were printed by um, a young printer who now has his own press. Um, I just want you to experience one moment of Leonard Baskin. Um, I've been dealing with Leonard Baskin my entire career. This is um, a piece um, uh, called Jewish Artists of the Early and Late Renaissance, a book of etchings and words by Gehenna Press in 1993. And it's one biography after another of very famous Jewish artists and engravers, half of whom are entirely fictional. Um, <laughs> but of course he doesn't tell you this. And it was one of those moments as a young librarian where I was making a presentation and, and the art historian that I was presenting it to was sort of looking at me and I read this moment, which I realized I had just become incredibly gullible. Um, because I had just bought this hook, line, and sinker. And he said, just read that again, Mark. Do you really think he moved from Poland to Italy to England and back? And it was just a sort of, it was um, Leonard Baskin at his best um, and his worst. So he launches for us a vast range of many more, more contemporary fine press people, not as traditional as Leonard Baskin. Uh, present tonight will be printers such as Claire Van Fleet, Peter Rutledge Koch, Vincent Fitzgerald, among others, whose work and entire careers have been devoted to shaping and promoting a contemporary sense of quality and craft, pushing the traditional letterpress book to newer expressions, and that's what we'll be looking at. Uh, the work of young printers and type designers continue in this effort and push the boundless, uh, the boundless um, parameters of the fine arts, fine press book, while still paying allegiance uh, to technique. And of course, uh, everyone's favorite, Claire Van Fleet. Do you have Aunt Sally's? Yes. Yeah. Do you have others? Yes. Yeah, good. <laughs> yeah. She, she buys really well, by the way, in case you didn't know. She has a really lovely collection. Um, Claire Van Fleet established the Janus Press in 1955, uh, and she's been pushing the press ever since. Uh, recognized as a MacArthur Fellow, uh, Van Fleet was distinguished, has distinguished her press work with unique design sensibilities, a penchant for non-adhesive book structures. For those of you who don't bind, that means you can literally take her books apart and put them back together again. And a list of titles that clearly reflect the printer's passionate relationship 
with text. Authors such as Kafka, Heaney, Ted Hughes, Le Carre, the inevitable Denise Levertov, Shakespeare, it goes on. The Library of Congress has collected her work from the beginning. We hold her archive. We have every pencil drawing, every scrap of calico, every sketch, every wood block. And what it does is it gives you access to the process of creating a Janus Press book. The most famous of which is this, Aunt Sally's Lament, done um, in Janus Press. Uh, it is a non-adhesive structure, a little bit of glue, but a non-adhesive structure that as it unfolds does two things. These triangles slip over, as you can see they do here, and they create the appearance of a patchwork quilt. But if you look around the edges in red, you can see, um, um, oh Lord, yes, my foot. Um, um, that's Aunt Sally's lament. And as the poem moves forward, all the other texts get covered except for Aunt Sally. So by the very end, all you have on this patchwork quilt is, my foot, hell of a woman, what are you talking about? It's, um, it's a really uh, a lovely piece that brings to, uh, brings to a very here, yes. Yes, oh Lord, yes indeed, and uh, around it goes. Um, the lovely thing about it is that you can unhinge the front tab and let it drop down into a vertical quilt. Um, and it's really quite a magnificent piece of work. I bring her up as a book artist because of her profound impact on printing, her profound impact on women in printing, and also because of her great experimentation with color and binding, especially the non-adhesive structure. Certainly her 1986 uh, production of um, King Lear will rank as one of the great 20th century printings of Shakespeare. Here is Claire Van Fleet as a printmaker. Um, when I was giving a talk back, in, back when um, God was a boy, um, <laughs> and I really thought I knew what I was talking about. And so I got up and I said, you know, sometimes it's not clear what artists, I, even, I was riding the same horse back then, can't tell what artists are telling us, and I think it'd be really helpful if artists would write a paragraph or two explaining you know, what they were doing with their book. And I was doing this at a meeting where Claire, Claire Van Fleet was being given a, an award uh, by our group, and you know, I said, just have to, doesn't be didactic. I mean, but you know, it would be very helpful if we could understand the relationship of the images to the text. And, um, and Claire Van Fleet gets up, and she gives this really lovely kind of, she's from Maine, kind of a gruff talk, and then she goes, "Diminution, go to hell." <laughs> I'm not writing up anything. <laughs> so um, uh, her King Lear is very rugged. Um, these are single page illustrations and very strong, but she uses the first folio text, so she's very strong in terms of her identification with the real text. She said in relationship to this book that I want the physicality of the book to create a physical message through the hands and the eyes to make the reader more susceptible to the text. And in many ways, I think you can fairly say that in almost all of her books. One of her most successful, more recent ones in 2006 was The Gospel of Mary, which ties um, a new translation of the gospel to a scientific overlay, um, which includes at the center one of her great non-adhesive pop-up uh, explosions. Yeah, they're fabulous books. Number three, Vincent Fitzgerald in this case, The Epiphanies of James Joyce, with one of the most famous title pages of the 20th century in terms of the fine press uh, movement, if nothing else. Since 1981, with the publication of his first book, Vincent Fitzgerald and Company has produced 50 astounding books in the lead artiste tradition. Fitzgerald combines the reverence of letterpress and printmaking, so perfectly extolled by Leonard Baskin and Gehenna, and adds to the mix a new understanding of text in collaboration, one that often forces the book to take on new shapes, new energies, new forms. Fitzgerald orchestrates the conception, design, and production of each of the limited edition books. He then goes out to find printers, illustrators, binders, has a conversation, and sets them free. So every Fitzgerald book <coughs> has a similar tone, but are very different in appearance. Um, he began his company in an effort to bring artists and writers together in a collaborative spirit so that the book would rise out of that collaboration. 
And uh, he has an impressive uh, parade of individuals, poets, translators, calligraphers, typesetters, and other artisans, binders, who have come in and have shaped the nature of the artist book in the 20th century through the offices of Vincent Fitzgerald, uh, Jerry Kelly, the calligrapher, uh, Suzanne Weil. Um, is it Weil? Suzanne? Weil? Uh, paper artist Paul Wong of uh, Dudenay Paper Mill, um, um, Daniel uh, Kelleher again from Wild, Pre Wild Carry Press, all the way up to a binder and more importantly a translator, Zahar Partovi, who's been very prominent in recent publications as she is the translator of Rumi's poetry, uh, which have been frequent in the most recent uh, Fitzgerald productions. So um, this range uh, speaks to Vincent Fitzgerald, but it's really personified in this one book of the Epiphanies. Uh, James Joyce wrote the Epiphanies um, between the ages of 18 and 21. They are sort of afterglows of dreams. Um, and there are 40 of them, and they range in topic from his childhood experiences to the death of his brother. They're broken down and they're organized into four categories, and the book is presented in that fashion. So in this case, um, this is from, the, um, from a section that's called Games, and it's um, a passage that Joyce has written about dancing um, and the dance of death in particular. And uh, the passage from the text that this is illustrating is, that is no dancing. Go down before the people, young boy, and dance for them. But the book's reading experience is this. For many, many pages, uh, you actually have the, the movement of dance um, between the text. So there are 64 etchings. There are original watercolors. There are collages. There are hand cuttings uh, for these 40 epiphanies. And they're presented in a way that's sort of portfolio, but really changes the nature of the book in many, many ways, including this kind of three dimension, this kind of physical interaction with imagery. It's no longer a flat image. You're actually making movement uh, with it. He goes on with Joyce again with another moment. In this case, it's a large box. The, man, the uh, text is in the center. You can see it's contained within an internal box. And the image around the outside is a frame. Uh, there are eight of those frames. And as you read through the book, you remove a frame and expose another image, and then another image, and another image while you're going through the book. So the illustration itself is contained on the outside of the book. Um, here from 1984, Manhattan Third Year Reader, you can see they have very little um, resemblance to each other as you go through uh, Vincent Fitzgerald publications. Um, this is me, I'm Mark Beard. I'm a Mormon from the town of Bountiful, uh, Utah. I don't know, I live on 27th Street. Here I am, unhappily waiting for love. Oh. Poor Mark Beard. <laughs> um, as I mentioned, um, most recently, Vincent Fitzgerald has been doing uh, lovely pieces that um, deal with the um, translations of um, uh, Zara Partovi, in this case, uh, Rumi's Deception. And the illustrations that go along with it are quite, that's a full page illustration, are really quite sensational. Um, so I was very pleased when I was uh, looking through Cynthia's uh, display today. I was worried that I was going to be pulling materials that just bounced on the outside of her collection that we weren't going to overlap. But this book is actually on display at the moment, so I'm very pleased. There are several others also today. Uh, this is the work of Peter Koch. Um, he's the printer. Uh, Deborah Magpie Erling is the poet who has written a poem called The Lost Journals of Sacagawea. Um, Peter Koch has materialized into one of the leading <coughs> modern printers and designers of the fine press book uh, movement in his generation. In the past 40 years, he has produced scores of letterpress books, hundreds of broadsides under various imprints, including Blackstone Press, Peter Rutledge Koch, Typographical Design, Peter and the Wolf Editions, <coughs> Peter Koch Printer, Editions Koch, and my favorite, Hormone Derange. <laughs> Uh, he prints, he prints uh, beer coasters using found typographical objects from Montana, like buckaroo cowboys and branding irons. And he prints beer coasters that say, lead ain't dead. It's, it's great stuff. Um, his early portfolio treatment of Robinson Jeffers' poetry um, and uh, Wolf uh, Fundenbush's uh, photographs uh, appeared in Point Lobos, which is now considered one of the contemporary masterpieces of the 21st, uh, 20th century. Um, but uh, his work has advanced since then from translations of the Greek 
and uh, to Buckaroo Poetry. Uh, Koch has staked a claim in the fine press printing territory, and not least of which is this magnificent book. Um, it's, this is a moment in which Koch, uh, in conjunction with um, uh, Deborah Magpie Erling, have worked to create a book in which uh, text and the format have a, a dialogue with each other. The shape, the format, the illustrations, even the presentation of the text in the Lost Journals of Sacagawea carry forward the fruit of a four-year collaboration with Deborah Magpie Erling. Erling is a member of the Confederated Salish and Kutenai tribes of the Flathead Reservation. Um, they take us into the imagined poetic ghost dreams of a 17-year-old Sacagawea in the years 1804 and 1805 when she's leading the expedition uh, to the West Coast um, across, at this point, across the Missouri River. Uh, illustrated by Koch with photo interventions, the entire physical production manifests meaning, and that's most clearly seen in the binding itself. Um, here we have the interaction of westward exploration as it intersects with traditional native lands and the kind of damage that's felt. The rough texture of the magnificent uh, cave papers, smoked buffalo rawhide, that's the name of this paper. Um, the juxtaposition of bone beads and spent bullet cartridges sewn into the spine, and then the red leather which pulled across the cover all speak to this moment of collision. Then you come to the book itself. The young woman's prophetic dreams are captured in shadowed, desolate historic photographs. Some of them bring forward massive destruction into modernity. Others simply are piles of corpses of buffalo. Other are these sort of lone um, members of a certain Native American tribe following some sort of raid or attack by uh, Anglo forces. Uh, this is perhaps one of Koch's most sympathetic renderings of text and image. Uh, and the piece is destined, I think, to become one of his most iconic pieces. Uh, he does play with the format of the book. Um, this is uh, from the, the late or the mid '90s. It's um, he worked a lot with he works a lot with uh, Thomas McElvey, and this is uh, a translation of Diogenes' depictions. Diogenes is sort of a thumb noser in, in uh, ancient Greece who. Um, took up the habit of following curses. When you write curses in ancient Athens, you write them on lead and you roll them up and you throw them into the garbage pit outside of town, which means now for us in modernity, when we're doing excavations, we often, these are the things we find because they're inscribed on lead and they survive. And so what we're getting is this very sort of snarky impression of our Athens, among other things. So um, Diogenes is a bit of a clown, and so here are his, his um, uh, defictions as they've been translated. And this is just an example. They're all like this. When Plato defined man as a featherless biped, Diogenes plucked a chicken and carried it into the lecture saying, here is Plato's man. <laughs> um, so this is very appealing, very much the character of, of uh, Peter Koch, for those of you who know him. He um, has an attraction for difficult materials, um, not the least of which um, uh, involves large photographic plates, in this case, with reversed uh, photo, uh, photography of large wooden letters. Uh, this is called a Nature Mort, uh, which takes the um, an unbelievably optimistic uh, phrases of Lewis and Clark against the depictions of what actually happens um, to his Montana, where he hails from, among other things. Um, and that conflict, as we find in Nature Mort by 2015, uh, and uh, Lieber um, in, in Ignis becomes a war. And uh, this entire book is printed on lead sheets. It weighs 30 pounds. And it's there because the conflict has become intractable and it's, it's war. And we see uh, uh, the desolation of mining. We see the destruction of the landscape. We see the sort of hollow, the hollow faces of miners as they're about to go deep into the stone. Uh, and then we see smoke and chimneys. It's a, a, it's a magnificent book. Uh, but again, demonstrates Koch's particular uh, ability, which many other book artists embrace, of letting ma the material itself aid in the expression of whatever the poetry or the text is trying to convey. Julie Chen's uh, Memento. Uh, Julie, run, Julie Chen runs a, a printing press in a press operation in the Bay Area called Flying Fish Press. Uh, she launched it in 1987. Um, the hallmark of any book 
by Julie Chen is equal emphasis on the physical nature of the book itself in relationship to the content. She is a master. She, she gave a talk recently and she kept calling people mistresses because she said that was the feminine of master. So she's, um, <laughs> she's the mistress of, of um, perfection in terms of her production. Um, they seem almost machined. Um, the, the, ma the physical manifestation of the book is often equal to this visual impact and her books often take on forms and shapes, they're operative, um, but she's a very, very articulate and smart bookmaker and she never falls into the mawkish or the eye rolling area that one could fall into when you start creating books that look like objects and move and squeak and spin and any number of things. Um, she's produced a very interesting catalog over time and certainly the one that uh, one of the ones that's most moving to me has been a memento. This is about the fragility of the book and the power of reading and it's a reflection on Chen's part on the bombing of the bookseller stalls at uh, on Nabi Street in 2007. It includes in this little locket a miniature book that's housed inside the locket, and uh, um, the leader, the reader, is asked to wear the book close to the body. The simple act of carrying a book on one's person has diverse implications depending on circumstances and place, but certainly at the time of the bombing would have been punishable. When the locket is open, on one side there is a book. On the other is a series, a triptych of images from um, the bookstalls themselves from the street, and then a woven set of texts <laughs> that is made up of the language of the preambles of the Constitution of the United States and Iraq. And then the chaos of the bombing that surrounds it. Um, it's, uh, Julie talks rather eloquently about the need for one to carry this, to wear this, and to understand the actual punishment that uh, has arrived at uh, for a belief in text. Uh, she's gone on to do other things with text, always conveying the real spirit in nature, or sometimes an ironic, ironic expression of it. So um, in this case, which is called Bon Bon Mo, um, from 1998, it's a box of chocolate. Uh, and each of these books in a miraculous piece of construction unfold either as a fan fold or one of them is a um, one of those wallets that works either way. Um, one of them mimics the behavior of whatever you call those. What are they? I never, I'm from Minnesota, we would never say that. <laughs> Fortune teller things. Um, <laughs> um, but if you read the poem and really consider what's going on, you realize that life isn't all that sweet. And that's, in fact, uh, what this box of chocolates is telling us. Uh, so the same is also um, with this. This is true to life. This is that moment where Ju only Julie Chen can make this kind of book. This is a, a sequence of shutters. And as you move each one up, a whole new page of text replaces the one prior to it. And you can read through it. It, it comes with its own base. It's intelligent. This is not trickery or uh, novelty. There is always a message in the physical action that you're undertaking as you're going through the text. Sometimes you find yourself going, oh, I get it. Uh, nowhere is that more clear than in this, which is a guide to higher learning. This comes in a box. And it's, it's a game in which you pull out slides and then they unfold into these pathways. Do you have this one? Good. <laughs> Take a look at it here. It's a really brilliant piece. And it's a, it's a game. It's a game of life. But unfortunately, no one does very well. And you don't learn that until right up toward the end, uh, where she kind of fills you in that, you know, life just ain't what you're thinking it was. <laughs> Henrik Drescher, Too Much Bliss, Granary Books. It's difficult to fully describe the range and impact of Steve Clay's Granary Books beginning in 86. He too was um, an impresario pulling together poets and binders and illustrators and craftspeople. His is much more of an edge than um, you would find with Vincent Fitzgerald. These are the likes of Susan B., Robert Creeley, uh, Tony Dove, Johanna Drucker, Timothy Ely. Um, 
like Gallo, Manny Gross, uh, Daniel Kelm, the list goes on and on. Um, these are edgy, smart books, each one specifically designed to carry that text appropriately as best as possible. And uh, in this case, Heinrich uh, Drescher's Too Much Bliss, uh, done in 1992. This is the cover with the Daniel Kelm binding. Johanna Drucker described this book as, this book has the look of some manic, encyclopedic, new age, Sears and Roebuck mail order catalog of all the elements that ever existed in the course of organic history and human memory. The subtitle says it all, scars, tattoos, and forgotten instructions, everything at once. And everything is here. Body parts, coffee stains, clumsy watercolor, cryptic hand, latex, rambling thoughts, gestures, there's letterpress with extensive collage, drawing, cutting, painting, latex pages, bound by uh, Daniel Kelm and the staff at Wide Awake Garage. It is a work that requires very intense reading. It is something to be read. And in my case, this is the hallmark of the book that pushes uh, what happens on the page in a direction that we hadn't seen until the arrival of characters such as this. And we have many, many book artists now that work in this kind of expression. Um, Granary is responsible for a variety of interesting books. This is uh, Buzz Spector's book from 1994 called The Passage. Um, it's actually one printed sheet of text that's been printed um, over um, uh, many, many times. Um, each of these books that he produced had 360 pages of the same text, which he tore each time a little further away from the gutter, right? Ultimately, the text is legible, but you are looking at 360 torn pages of text. Now, this is an edition of 48 books, 360 pages. He tore 17,280 pages to complete this work. Um, this is one of my favorite stories in which um, um, and Tony Dove had worked on a, a book of poetry called uh, Mesmer, and she was connected to Daniel Kelm by uh, Steve Clay in 93, and they were having a conversation. For those of you who don't know Daniel Kelm's binding, among other things, he's introduced something called the wire binding, which he's very uh, liberally and generously allowed everyone to see how to make so everyone can use it. Um, and Tony was talking to him about how she wanted a particular kind of patina and feel to her book. And he said, you know, we'll go get stuff and we'll talk about it. So they were in New York. She went to Canal Street and she went to a sort of craft shop and she came back with aluminum sheets and uh, mosquito netting and plastic mesh and iridescent plastic film. And as an idea of, I want this kind of look. Kelm took up all the material and returned using those materials to bind this which is this magnificent moment of sort of really coarse, unexpected materiality juxtaposed with Tony Dove's poems in a way that could only happen in this book. Um, he, uh, Kelm goes on to say, um, the binding became an articulate exoskeleton of, with ligaments holding the fleshy interior to the bones. This makes sense if you know Daniel Kelm. Ken Campbell, The Word Returned. Um, over the past four decades, Ken Campbell has created a body of work that is unchained, free of affiliation, beholden to nothing other than the strike force of the creative vision of this English poet and printer. With each book, it is undeniably clear that Campbell's art bursts out on the press, impromptu like jazz. It's concocted when poetry and vision collide on the page. It is an art that belongs to the poet and the printer. It is unmistakably the art of the book, and it can only be Ken Campbell. It's important when viewing Ken Campbell's work to cut away to the core, to the origin and the impetus behind his books. Stuck deep beneath their, you have no idea how many layers of ink are on this page. Um, stuck deep beneath the thick, sophisticated layers of texture and color are words and text and fable and story. Much of his work in the 1980s experiments with the visual presentation of verse and text. In the word returned, uh, I think probably his most visually stunning book, um, several texts are presented in a do -si do format, uh, including the poem Dear Judas, which is, as he says, dedicated, my dedicated to my family those people who climb out of rocks. 
Um, amidst references to Abbey and the golem, and with images of wings and cascading computer type, Campbell has set the Judas poem in letter forms that are actually made out of zinc stencils. Have you ever seen the logotype for Rent, the musicals? These sort of zinc squares that have a stencil letter? Um, Campbell has set the whole poem, you can see the stencil letters, using these zinc uh, stencils, but they can't go butt to butt. It just leaves too much space. So to space the letters properly, each has to be printed individually to allow for the overlap of the stencil's frame. So with an edition of 50 in a do-si-do -do format, the entire poem required 66,000 crankings of his proofer. Uh, with a technique that uh, Campbell employed earlier, he picked up objects from his printing floor, in this case a set of blocks that we would normally use for furniture, and printed the background. It's hard to see here, but there's a sort of set of squares that are showing up in the background. He would pick up the metal diamond plate that he was standing on for safety and ink it up and print that and put it over. In fact, you can see it right there. See the diamonds? That's the diamond plate that he inks. Um, so by the time you get his book, it is uh, a paper it turns into the feel of oilcloth. Uh, it's, it's unlike anything else. And this is true, you can see here, the layers of printing and the slamming of the press. This is a knife romance from 1998. This is Tilt from um, also the same, uh, same year. And this, which is 10 years at Uzbekistan. This is Ken, um, uh, Ken's um, response to modern warfare, turning back to a book that had been put out by Alexander um, Rudchenko. His book list, um, was a depiction of images of uh, individuals who had disappeared in the Stalinist regime sweeps. They were portraits. Ken has taken those images and blocked them out to talk about what modern um, politics has done. Now you'll see around the edge, he had a pewter plate. He wanted this to sort of frame the, um, the image to give it a kind of flat um, appearance of a frame. But the pewter was beginning to bounce a lot in the pressing and curl. And um, Ken, if nothing else, is very quickly expressive. <laughs> Gets really pissed off. And um, <laughs> took a staple gun and stapled the crap out of these pewter plates and then left them so that when he prints now, they actually emboss the paper. This is the world of Ken Campbell. Very different from this young gentleman here, Russell Merritt. As I look back on my association with Russell Merritt, I realize I have witnessed two decisive career-shaping moments with this um, that have contributed to his emergence as possibly the finest printer and typographer of his generation. He's in his young 40s at this point. Um, the first was made known to me um, years later, um, although I remember well the event as it played out. It was perhaps Russell's first visit to the Library of Congress. I now own his archives as well. Um, first visit to the Library of Congress. He arrived all poetic and engaging and cigarette smoking. And we had one of those lovely conversations where we really connected about books. And I could really see that I had this smart, erudite uh, young printer who looked really short on cash and, <laughs> and hungry and hungry to print. And he was frustrated because he was, it takes money to be a book artist. Um, so I took a look at his books. I bought them all. Some of them really showed promise, some of them really didn't show anything at all. Uh, years later, Russell told me that this visit had been his last straw and that before he came into the Library of Congress, he stood outside and smoked a cigarette and promised himself that he hadn't, if he hadn't sold anything, he would abandon printing. So I like to say this is, um, um, I've never made a more important acquisition. Um, soon after that, young Russell came out with Ethelwald, etc. 26 letters inspired by other letters and non-letters and little bits of poetry rendered with accompanying notes. And this is in 2009. Um, and this is the other moment, the other decisive moment that I witnessed. Um, for a few years prior, his output had been fairly restrained. You saw 
Prometheus Bound, which had smoke paintings on, on the title page, and other works by Russell, but they were kind of tempered. Nothing would have prepared me for viewing this extraordinary accomplishment, this three-volume work. Where did all of this book come from? M Merritt's engagement with a personal sense of typography has flourished, prompting this magnificent work. Um, the 26 letters raise the question of if a letter is not in the company of another letter, is it still a letter? <laughs> and then the letters carry on that conversation throughout this book. It's a major book. It's serious. This is not play. And ultimately, as he will do in other books, he cut, he designed and cut all of the typefaces that are in this book. Um, <clears throat> so um, this is his question. And uh, he is tackling the relationship between alphabet and content and color and representation, personal readings and formal typography. So this is the letter O from Ethelwald. Uh, and it taught us that the distinct form of a letter was not inherently defining. A letter takes on meaning or legibility, he says, when it's in the company of other letters, in the communal form of the alphabet. And then this brings forward a variety of texts that he has selected from various authors in which he talks about the communal nature of text and the meaning of words living together and the poetry and the experience that this, it's, it's uh, like for someone his age in particular, a really profound work. Um, and the fact that all of this speaks to much larger life issues, I think, is a profound and captivating lesson of Russell's work. Here's the letter T. This is also a lovely piece of color printing that's one, two, three, four, five, six faces of color to create just the shading here. Uh, and he'll go on to do the same. And in fact, he provides with, at the end of his work, a color diary of the color ink that he printed for each of the day. So for, um, on 528, he printed the letter U using all of these colors and the letter E down there. Um, so uh, in the short span of three years, uh, he creates three profoundly complex and satisfying works of such beauty and care that he has clearly risen, I think, to a whole new level of mastery in text. To offer Ethelwald, etc., Specimens of Diverse Characters, his next book, and his final Interstices and Intersections or an Autodidact Comprehends the Cube, each in their own right, easily a, master, a printer's masterpiece, in rapid succession, two years between each, is nothing short of a bravura performance. Um, here is the specimen's title page. Uh, here he's taking shapes and then treating them as alphabet, the opposite, in other words. But it's presented as if it's a type specimen. Uh, in this case, he designed 20 typefaces to print this book. And has color printed in here that really is a level of finesse. But this book uh, is really the moment in which everything comes forward. It, it's uh, Merritt places himself in the text. He has taken one proposition from each of the 13 books of Euclid's Elements of Geometry. He quotes the book and then he has a personal reflection about its meaning to his life and then depicts the geometric object that's being discussed in that element of geography. Um, here he mixes his own inks from uh, get-go to create the level of color and the hues and the depth and transparency. Each of the pages runs through the press 25, 225 times to get the color. It's an amazing piece of work. Uh, in the early days of his career, while back um, as a young printer, um, uh, Russell hit kind of a, a plateau and he was a little uh, discouraged um, and gradually through printing he found himself back again and went back to uh, typography and printing and returned to the book in a way that was true to his origins. Um, and he wrote something then that I think rings very much true today for as well. Um, he said, uh, I, I, I played with this until it finally clicked again and then something happened. I suddenly understood what the printed book wanted to be, how the typography should work, what typeface to use, everything. Everything indeed. So whether it be uh, Merritt's efforts to understand the nature of the letter, independent of its relationship to the alphabet, or whether it be Vincent Fitzgerald's recognition that design and materials are integral to relating image and sculpture to the understanding of Rumi's poetry, these books engage the reader directly and with full disclosure. We started late, yes, didn't we? Okay. Otherwise, it's going to be a baker's eight.
<laughs> Sorry. Women's Studio Workshop was founded in 1974 uh, by Anne uh, Kalmbach, Tatana Kellner, Anita Wetzel, and uh, Barbara Lofberg. Uh, their goal was to develop a studio workspace for artists to create new work and collaborate. Programs were centered on the artistic process as well as on production. They envisioned a society where women's art was integral to the cultural mainstream and permanently recorded in history. The first studios were a two-story single-family home. They have since gone on to a very large plant in which all facets of book production are created. Um, over the years, uh, more than 150 uh, women's studio workshop interns have produced more than 200 limited edition artist books. Uh, Tatana Kellner used to come visit me, and she would bring out um, some books from the previous, year, previous years, and it was always, I just, you know, I, I, how do you decide this and not that, and, and um, I would always get kind of flummoxed, and I had once said to her that I had this thing about people who did fan folds and then didn't use the back of the fan fold, and I thought that this was laziness and that there was a counterpoint or a continuation of the article or even graphic space, something that they could do, and she kind of remembered this, and I bought a few books, and she came back the next year, and she was showing me some books, and I was setting them aside, and an assistant reached for a book, and she slapped her hand and said, no, don't show them that. <laughs> To which, of course, I said, gee, I would really love to see that book. <laughs> um, and she said, no, 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 you don't want to see that book. I said, I really want to see that book. And so I went through it, and I said, what's so offensive about this? And she said, well, look on the back. And I, said, and I laughed. There was nothing on the fan fold back. And I said, it was really just a, an opinion. It wasn't, you know, dire. Um, so I had all these books in front of me. And I said, you know, I'm, every time you come, I have difficulty deciding what to do. Here are all these books by these young women bookmakers. Some of them have great promise. Some of them are really substantial already. I just don't know what to do, so I'll just buy everything. And she said, everything on the table? And I said, no, I'll just buy everything. So I bought the Women's Studio Workshop. <laughs> and that included every book ever produced by WSW. And that included, among other things, Tatana Kellner's book done in 1992. This one is entitled B11226, 50 Years of Silence. And she's done two books, one for her grandfather, one for her, um, or her parents, actually, one for her mother and one for her father. Um, these are preserving the parents' memory of internment in concentration camps. Uh, it's hand, the text is in handwritten Czech. It's also transcribed into English by the author. It's printed over contemporary and historical photographic images from concentration camps. The original manuscript is produced on transparent interleaved leaves, so you read it as you go through. Somebody, we were um, uh, talking about this book today, and someone had asked, because the copy is now here as well, whether you ever can get past the cutaway of the arm, uh, to which we both almost said in units, and of course you can't, you can't escape the reality of this experience. So this is the nature of the books that come out of WSW. I will give you a taste. Skinny Leg by Jenny Lynn, 2012. Um, spiky haired, spunky, foul mouth, bicycle messenger, um, a book artist who created the most amazing pop-up book about her bike accident. <laughs> and um, how her broken leg, um, and takes you through the hospital experience, how her, um, her lover leaves her in the midst of the lurch and then comes back and then leaves with all these amazing, funny pop-ups that you would never imagine. The next page shows um, a paper doll of her, and then she said, these are all the clothes that they had to cut off, and as you're turning through the book, you realize you're basically um, undressing her as the hospital would, and it goes on and on. It's, it's quite amusing. Barbara um, uh, Beisinghoff's Henry Miller's uh, the Angel in, um, is My Watermark from 2009. Angela Lawrence's book, Lay Text, or Lay Text, <laughs> uh, with um, Im um, impressions of art that are printed on lay text sheets that are not to be handled, comes in a zipper case. Uh, and finally, Maureen Cummins' uh, crazy, crazy Quote, which is up already in, in uh, the museum here. Robin Price. 43, according to Robin Price. The idea for Robin's uh, book 
uh, came to her while she was attending a, a solo jazz uh, saxophone performance, and she was listening to the mathematical counting that was happening, and she realized as her 43rd birthday was approaching that this kind of overlay of math on her life experience might be an interesting way of organizing. So um, it involved the numbering of 43 involved as a lens for examining her life, <coughs> taking 86 books, uh, excerpts from each of them, using 43 to locate what excerpt she takes and where to place it. Um, her work is always about detailed research. Um, she's grouped the text. This is a fan fold. This is a Daniel Kelm binding on the outside. Um, she's mimicking um, an encyclopedia that comes from um, um, the, the second encyclopedia, Thong. It's long. It's called from a, um, I just lost his name. A surrealist uh, South American author. Um, um, Borges. Borges. Borges, thank you. So he's made up an encyclopedia and she's borrowing that notion. So there are subject headings here that will then arrange the talks. Um, and she's actually, um, as we'll see here, she's borrowed a river from Carolee Campbell's book uh, from Ninja Press. She's actually lifted the river and put it in hers um, because of the inspiration of Carolee. So there are paper maps that are gathered behind here um, are all running on the 43rd parallel. Um, she has numbers that decide what passages are there. Everything you read through revolves around 43 in a very creative, engaging way, not in a gimmick, but in a puzzle that leads you to go through from page to page. It can unfold into a huge fanfold, or you can read it as a codex. Um, it comes with a 32-page annotated bibliography of the books that are referenced, and it's done in an edition of 86 because she said 43 seemed too few. <laughs> so her earlier work, though very different visually, represents the same tendency towards research. Journey of the Qatar from uh, 1999 is a portrait of Pepe Romero, uh, and the illustrations that you find there are evocative both of the poetic content of his work and the guitar itself. Slurring at the bottom is very much like a work that Walter Hamaday does at the end of the year, uh, where he gathers together the detritus of his printing operation and reformats it so that new artists have the opportunity to use detritus to make a new book. And in this case, it's called Slurring at the Bottom as a way of solving her printing problems, she says. Uh, and then most recently, this magnificent piece, Yosef um, Komenyaka, um, Pulitzer Prize winning poet. He was actually reading today, yesterday, at the Library of Congress. Uh, Love in the Time of War. This is printed silk, dyed silk, printed with silver ink, um, double folded with, um, for, um, what do you call it, four edge fold, um, so that she can then slide in pieces of colored paper behind the silk and bind. So that's what creates those shadows behind the silk. It's an amazing piece called Love in the Time of War, which is a, a very intense um, objection to violence itself. Veronica Schaefer's, uh, we call it the Squid Book. Uh, it's really the coordinates that uh, you're looking at. Um, she's a German book artist who has spent many, many years in Japan, and her uh, experience in those two locales creates an artistic voice and vision that no one else has ever matched. Uh, she plays with transparencies and masking. She uses materials that are very Japanese in style. The book ostensibly is about the first Japanese discovery of a giant squid off the coast of Tokyo. And these are the coordinates. She never depicts, she never depicts the squid. But what you get instead is this kind of book that is both a mystery, but you feel as if you're submerging. And she does this with folded paper. Some of this paper, paper is Japanese stencil paper that can be folded. And there are always these kind of reveals. There are three poems um, that are slowly made transparent. But the whole, ex the whole experience is descending into depth um, and is an unbelievable uh, visual experience of poetry. Um, a more recent book of hers is a book about uh, the ghost forest in Japan where uh, ill people or the elderly walk into 
commit suicide and never come out, and it's the same thing. So the motif that's consistent when Veronica Schaefer's work is this kind of masking and trans, the masking, using transparency as a device to mask uh, and to reveal very little to create a kind of um, a very meager poetic experience that speaks volumes at the same time. The bad boys and girls of Brooklyn, New York, <laughs> who have changed my life and have introduced graffiti, uh, graphic novels, um, any number of techniques, uh, including handmade books, uh, but have actually revolutionized uh, the book arts world. And uh, one of which, of course, is the book that you're seeing the cover of, which is Watch Your Step. This is Fred Ryan, Dana Smith, and Scott Williams. Um, Fred Ryan is a San Francisco stencil, um, cart uh, stenciler, um, graffiti stenciler, who has taken his stencils to the book, uh, but they've provided um, a digital background on which to paint. Uh, so half of this is stencil, half of this is, uh, or a third of this is stencil, third of this is a digital photograph, and another third is artistic rendering on the page. And these are alien creatures that live amongst us in San Francisco. These are, um, the, the subject you can imagine is quite crazed, uh, but it's an incredibly powerful and uh, precise book uh, that quite correctly warns you to watch your step. Um, out of the same crowd comes um, uh, a do si -do, uh, by David Sandlin. It's one of three uh, parts of a series he's working on uh, that deal with um, sort of a modern day um, uh, search of the, of the colonial spirit, so if you will. And in this case, the Dosi Do has two covers, um, Road to Nowhere and Road to Paradise. And, uh, it's just, and uh, it raises the question, it, it raises the legitimate question of whether the um, used car man who is uh, robbing you blind is any more guilt and guilty than the self-righteous um, uh, evangelist who's robbing your soul uh, by collecting money, and they meet in the center. Um, Brooklyn has been enormously influential in bringing in a whole host of new book artists uh, that then move forward in ways that are just unexpected. We made 13. <laughs> Casey Gardner, Body of Inquiry. Uh, we were talking about Codex uh, today, and I met Casey Gardner at Codex. Uh, Codex is a gathering of book artists that has uh, happened. And she's a book artist that um, is in Berkeley. Uh, in Berkeley. Uh, she prints um, in Set in Motion Press is the name of her work. This is um, a book called Body of Inquiry. Uh, done in 2011. It's, um, she says that what inspired her, um, her work is, much of her work reminds me of Ju Julie Chen in a way. Julie Chen has a very graphic hand, and her printing is so clean that it looks like it isn't hand printing, but it is. And it's the same with, with um, uh, uh, Casey Gardner. In this case, uh, what inspired her was that every day she was walking past a female anatomical model and she said she admired the model's enviable composure despite her utterly available and exposed viscera. <laughs> <laughs> you really handle it well, she thought. Um, so she said, for years I referred to her as Our Lady of Serene Evisceration <laughs> and began to marvel at her inner workings. And out of that came because uh, Casey can be quite playful, but she's deadly serious about what she's doing. And what comes out of this is a series of panels. Some of them address the origins of life, others address equipment, and then you have the body parts. But if you have an opportunity to play with this, these body parts don't necessarily refer to the function of the body part. They often refer to the aspect of the female um, who carries something or uh, filters something or withstands something, and it takes on lobes of fusion and diffusion, um, uh, four chambers of purifying and recharging. And she makes this whole kind of anatomy lesson into uh, a feminist lesson of a very high order around this notion of science. Um, on the outskirts of the um, display that she's creating, which folds up like a codex, 
our um, 19th century medical equipment, but the most fantastical and poetic uh, Casey Gardner descriptions of what they're actually there for. And the whole piece uh, begins to take on a kind of, of um, cleverness uh, that's teaching you something really fundamentally important and does it in a, in a way that's, I think, really um, creative and I think very forward looking. This is her more uh, recent work. Uh, it's called the Gravi um, Gravity Series Falling, Climbing, and Orbiting. There are three books that are attached to the panel uh, with magnets. Each of them deals with one aspect of gravity. Um, it, it, uh, you fall, as in love, uh, you climb, as in. Um, effort and you orbit as in um, another aspect of love and um, but all the time put in this kind of scientific discussion so as this discussion has suggested if we're to become better readers of these works we need to enter into a dialogue uh, that each demands of us um, an order that they be comprehended on their own terms at times, I think we're in the territory between the traditional book and art on the wall. Some of these books are very hard to cope with in a traditional conversation. Artist books function differently as cultural objects, uh, many of which have little to do with formal constructions of art. Some of them have very little to do with formal constructions of books. Each approaches the notion of origins, context, and importance from a different understanding of the book as a cultural object. When it comes to artist books, we have only begun to develop a language that expresses fluently our universe of understanding. In the meantime, book artists have moved well beyond this distinction. They're way ahead of us. Uh, they're out there forging a new conceptualization of the book, one that will irrevocably alter our experience of the book as an object and as a conduit of meaning. How we place the work of art of an individual book artist or how we point to that which is new or path-breaking, or even how we describe the impetus behind the book remains, for the moment, merely a matter of poetics. If you'll bear with me for one second, I want to solve in part, or remedy in part, this notion that there are only 13 important <laughs> book artists out there. There's an, I don't want to call these also rans. I want to call this uh, the next generation that are pushing at the edges um, I could do a hundred of them, but I've just chosen a few because I think they have meaning. This will be painless and they'll go by very fast. Sam Winston, who plays with uh, word poetry, has a fabulous book called Dictionary Story, where the words of the dictionary melt and create new meanings. Werner Pfeiffer, whose book called Zippo allows you to take panels of poetry, unzip them and zip them together in a different order, and still have poetry. Maria Veronica, uh, Veronica San Martin, in their memory, human rights, um, human rights uh, regulations and violations, Chile, um, um, a Chilean uh, book artist who is commemorating the people who have disappeared, the ghosts of the Chilean movement. Colette Fu, who goes to China, studies the tribal regions of, of China, and then makes these amalgamated pop-up books that are unlike anything you've ever seen. Timothy Ely, who doesn't live very far, who creates from here, who creates these majestic uh, fabricated alternative realities of science and geography. Laura Davidson, who works with found objects and single drawings and creates uh, universes of poetry. Uh, Alice Austin, whose book Mosaic is just one of many of her tunnel books that she's now working on. Emily Martin's exploration of Shakespeare, um, a feminist exploration of Shakespeare. Ken Botnick's uh, amazingly beautiful study of Diderot's encyclopedia. Nancy Lober's reductive prints of portraits. Uh, and, and finally, this guy. Thank you very much.